Hi there, it's me, Joe List. Welcome back to the Mindful Metal Jacket podcast. Well, welcome back or welcome for the first time. Perhaps it's your first time being here because you saw the guest is my friend, legend, one of the great comics of all time, Colin Quinn. CQ, they call him. Uh, very excited for this episode. I'll keep it short and brief up here, up front. Some people like the long intros. Some people hate the long intros. I'm a people pleaser. I'll split the difference. Uh, very exciting episode. Uh, it was fun to get Colin. I love Colin. He was a dream guest. Uh, as you'll hear up front, Colin does not enjoy doing podcasts. So uh, an extra special get and an extra special favor, frankly, uh, for him to do for us here. So uh, glad we uh, have him. And it was great talking to him, as it always is. I love Colin. He is uh, one of my... I would say three or four favorite comedians of all time. He's one of my three or four favorite people of all time and uh, has certainly had a profound impact on my life. And he is what I'm trying to be as a comic and a person. So very thrilled to have him. We talk a lot of comedy. We talk some New York. We talk a little depression. And uh, it was really enjoyable. I think you'll enjoy it. Hopefully, if you're a comedy nerd like myself, you'll definitely enjoy it. And uh, I did the best I could to make it a good episode. Um, there's some things I wish uh, I had asked or we had done better, or I had done better, certainly. But um, I still think it's a good episode. I think you'll enjoy it. I want to give a shout out to Gotham Studios uh, here in New York City, a fantastic podcast studio. It's the home of uh, the great podcast, We Might Be Drunk, with my friends Mark Norman and Sam Marill. And they were nice enough to uh, give me this studio space to record this episode with Colin Quinn and a future episode with Ali Makovsky. It's a hell of a podcast a studio, Gotham Studios, right in Midtown Manhattan. And uh, what wonderful, kind people. It's uh, much better looking and sounding uh, than this cell phone intro I'm doing by myself. And uh, they're just awesome. So I want to shout them out and uh, hit them up for all your podcasting uh, studio needs. And I also just want to say uh, thank you for everybody who's subscribed here. If you're listening to the podcast, if you enjoy the podcast and you're not subscribed, subscribe to the YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to wherever you're listening to this podcast. Give a nice review. Leave a nice comment in the YouTube, a like, a share. Tell a friend what we're doing here. So many people send me really nice messages and emails saying how much the podcast means to them. And uh, I thank you. Keep doing that. It really helps and uh, I think soon we're going to have a Patreon with a bunch of bonus stuff. I've already recorded a bunch of extra stuff. So um, get excited for that. Another Patreon for you to join or for you to get mad that it exists and not join. Either way, appreciate you. Very grateful for all of you. And I also just want to plug the special Enough for Everybody. It's kicking butt over there on YouTube. If you'd rather not watch it on YouTube since they sort of... Uh, minimize my ads, uh, which is frustrating. You can watch it at Punch Up Live. Go to punchuplive.com slash Joe List, I think it is, or put my name in there. You can sign up for my email list and get tickets for my future dates. I will be in Philadelphia, the great, great state of Philadelphia. It's a city, I know. I'm supposed to be a joke, but then you guys will write. He thinks it's a state. Anyways, Philadelphia, Helium, October 5th through the 7th. That's the last weekend I'm working before my child is born. So uh, come on out to that, Philly. Watch the special and um, enjoy this conversation with uh, the great, the great, great Colin Quinn, my friend, my idol. Here it comes. I've said too much already. Enjoy. Thank you. I love you. Be nice to yourself. All right, this is it. This is All the right. pod. We're podcasting, Colin. Yes, Joe. Your favorite. <laughs> it feels. I feels like we're fighting. I. I, I feel like we're a, lo- a married couple. We, no, you, you. I came in. First of all, we all know how I feel about podcasts, or at least me and you do, and everybody else. But then I came in. I was being quiet, not because I was mad. Okay. I was be- or passive aggressive. I was being quiet because I was like, save it for the podcast. Oh, I because, don't know about the save. What's that? I don't know about the save. You don't? No, we don't need to save. We're 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 men. No. We're we're jovial. We have a lot to say. We're exactly. comedians. But sometimes you when you come and you haven't seen each other in a while, we're like, ah and then next thing we're on the podcast and we just already shot the wad. I that's suppose. how I feel. Okay, that's fair. Do we're you ever have this experience where you're at the comedy, you go to a comedy club with all your friends, you're rolling upstairs, you're like, Hey, everybody's laughing, you're killing. You're like, I really am so funny. 
And then you go on stage and there's nothing there. Yes. Well, I was saving that pot I was saving this podcast from that fate. I suppose that's fair. That's true. But I mean, I came in. I thought I was getting the silent treatment. I felt like you were upset. I'm a very I sensitive know. boy. You know this about me. I Come know. Along. But the, you know what I mean? You weren't. It was just, that's what was happening. All right. Well, I appreciate you doing this. I know you hate podcasts. I yeah, feel terrible. We're past that already. All right. I know. But maybe the people at home don't know. Well, no, I mean, they're pay- we're past that because I already said that at the beginning of this. Uh, I see. I also feel like you're a very private person. I'm very, uh, really. Yeah, don't you think? No. Oh, all right. I don't. You're not a guy that goes on podcasts and is like, "Boy, my wife and I, we really were fighting." Oh and she no, said my this, wife would. And I my wife that. would be so mad if I did that. Really? Yeah, she wouldn't like that. Yeah, because some people, it's all out there, and I feel yeah. like I, sometimes I feel like I can't take that back now because I did it for so long. Right. We did podcasts for so long, and this is something you're always talking about. Is that um, I've said everything on every podcast, so I never thought about it, and now with some success, not a huge amount of success. You realize there are thousands and thousands of people that know about my STDs and the way I behaved when I was sure. younger. Sure, yeah. And uh, they can really use well, that Well, I mean, you. they do get comfort from that because, you know, a lot of people go through the same thing. So it is kind of a, you know, there's something good about the fact that you're letting people go, hey, you're not alone. I mean, that's good. No, that is good. And that's kind of what this show is about in a lot of ways. But there's also times where I'm like, Sometimes, like, um, you'll read about a celebrity and be like, he was fiercely private, like a Johnny Carson or something. And right. You're like, man, maybe I should have gone that route. Yeah, I, I really, this is not the culture you live in. You guys live in a different culture. I like I said, so. even your wife, she understands because she, she's a performer too, but also because it's a certain generation is like, don't talk about me on the podcast. You know what I mean? Right. And you guys are like, it's just. Everything's out in the open. Everything's filmed. Everybody's got pictures of everybody. Everybody speaks every opinion they have. It's all out there. Yeah. It, it backfires a lot, but still, it's out there. Of course. But there are comedians that don't do Like Daniel Simonson. You know Daniel. But he's Norwegian. That doesn't count. <laughs> you can't <laughs> but, count him. But he's a great comedian. He doesn't go on podcasts. And he, he and Joe Mackey's another person that keeps things very uh, Close private. to the vest? Yes. Oh. So there's people that do it. But I feel like you're closer to that than you are to, you know... Me. Well, okay. Don't you think that? I feel like there's not a I lot I feel of... like I laid it all out when I wrote my books and in my early stand-up. And I guess so. I, I guess feel so. like I, you know what I mean? I feel like it's all from the early days. But right, it, if I was around today, I'm sure I'd be much more, yeah. But I mean, I I don't have any big, uh, you know. Maybe I mean, you're right. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know better than me. I don't know. I guess. I don't know. I don't even think <laughs> about this kind of thing. But anyways, I appreciate you being here. You're a, you're a big get. <laughs> somebody, I mean, somebody, I, I like to do this podcast with people I know that have struggled with depression, anxiety, whatever it is. And then we talk and I think it's a really interesting conversation. But yeah. then the audience at home goes, well, I never heard of this fucking guy. I'm not listening to this. Right. Somebody wrote to me, they're like, you're so self-sabotaging. You're having a, no disrespect to the past guests. Right. They're like, you're so self-sabotaging. You keep having guests that nobody's ever heard of. Right. And I said, well, I'm going to go for the big gun. Yeah, it is kind of sad that you, that, that, that matters. That, that it's like, people are like, hey, you still, you people still want people you've heard of on these damn things? It's insane to me, but it's still the way it is. Well, that's how I try to look at it as well. I'm, but I guess I'm not big enough for this. A Rogan can bring in a completely unknown person right. and go, here he is, America, here's this person. Right. In my mind, I'm like, let me expose some people you haven't heard of. Right. But... There's so much content now. If they don't know who the person is, they go skip. That's right. And that's uh, so they tell them I brought in my biggest, my biggest celebrity friend. The biggest celebrity friends. Well, I do know Meryl Streep. You do? Yeah. You never heard that story? No. Uh, I hung out with Meryl Streep twice. Wow. Yeah. And she owes me 20 bucks. Why? I'm coming for you, Meryl. Hi, folks. This episode of Mindful Mental Jacket is brought to you by DoorDash. You know DoorDash. You love DoorDash. I need DoorDash in my life. I'm a delivery kind of guy. That's what I like to do. It's back to school and things are getting hectic. When you don't have time to drag your toddler with you to the grocery store and watch them sob because you won't buy them candy, you turn to DoorDash. That's the best way to do it, damn it. DoorDash grocery delivery. You can get exactly what you want delivered right to your door and skip the temper tantrums. Plus, it saves you time. I live in New York City. It's a pain in the butt to walk to the grocery store, up and down the aisles. Here in this city, if somebody's in your aisle, you just have to go home. You can't even get by them. And I've been to the suburbs and gone to those grocery stores. It's a pain in the butt out there. Everyone's got their little babies and all that crap. 
Get it delivered right to your door. Save the time. You can do your push-ups or your writing or your meditating or your therapy, whatever you're going to do. You've trusted DoorDash to bring you nachos when you were drunk at 2 a.m., and now they're here to help you stock the pantry. I love the word pantry. Like a true friend, they've seen you through good times and bad, so sit back, relax, and let DoorDash bring you that head of lettuce you need for dinner. Here it is, folks. Get 50% off your first DoorDash order of up to $20 value when you use code METAL at checkout, M-E-T-A-L. Limited time offer. Terms apply. That's 50% off, up to $20. No minimum subtotal and zero delivery fees on your first order. When you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code METAL, M-E-T-A-L. Don't forget that code METAL for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. 50%! Back to the show. Uh, we hung out. We showed. Um, Louis made a movie years ago, and he we, he screened it for some people, and she was one of them, and myself. Wow. And then uh, after she had no money, and Louis had no food in his house, these people. And I was like, well, I got 20. You can take 20 bucks from me. Wow, that's pretty cool. Oscar winner. Owes so, you 20 bucks. That's right. Well, you know, my only celebrity, Ozzy, is Mayor Bloomberg, which I've talked about many times. I filled in Daryl Hammond bail on some mayor thing when he was mayor early on and I saved the day by going and bombing in front of these people trying to do this New York thing and he goes I owe you one and I go thanks and he goes I don't just say that I always pay my debts oh and for years I was like how am I going to get this back how am I going to bring up this thing with Bloomberg you know I'll never see him I don't have his number I can't and you can't bring it up even if you know the person you can't be like hey man remember the time you said that thing and um I wanted to get like a lifetime free parking pass or something anywhere in this anywhere in the city. I could park anytime. Yeah. You know, that would be good. Or I don't know, something big I wanted. Even though it wasn't that big of a favor, I still wanted something big. But I think you could still call in that favor. Although you're more of a New York fixture than Bloomberg at this point. Yeah, but I mean, he has more power and money. Well, certainly money. He's like a trillionaire. You're acting but- like I could do him favors. You could do them so. You could get them in at the cellar and get them in at the late show at the VU. <laughs> That's true. Something like that, maybe. Yeah. Um, but let's let's get into it. I don't have any notes. I got no questions. Whoa. I got no anything. I had some notes that I wrote down, which I don't usually do. But I was like, well, for the legend CQ, I got to yeah. have some notes. Damn right. But my phone is charging over there. Oh. Now, I want to ask you this, because and I hope this isn't too uh, personal. I remember years ago when we first met, yeah. fucking 20 years ago or something. I don't know. Maybe it was 16, 17 years ago. I don't know. I, I know better than you, yeah, obviously. Yeah, really. I met you in 2006, which yeah. is 17 years ago. Wow. Do you remember where, I, where we met? Yep, Comedy Connection. That's right. I met you at the Comedy Connection. And you knew me through it because I was opening for DePaulo, so you knew of me. Right. And then uh, we did that. I thought it was a corporate gig. I did a gig opening for you guys. Remember that? Uh, no. In Harrisburg. No. We open, You don't remember that? You, me, and Nick. Nope. Come on. You don't remember I that? Don't. We, 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 we started out, we got a car service. I stayed at Nick's house because I lived in, in Boston at this time. I remember time. that part. I, I stayed at Nick's house in Westchester, Nick DiPaolo, the great Nick DiPaolo, funniest person I've ever met. Yours number no, two. No, he is. Yeah, of course. Um, and then we got a car service. We got in the car. We were going to have this guy pick you up in Midtown and then go to like Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The three of us were going to sit in this car with this man. Right. And he said something... That Nick perceived as snarky. So Nick took the car to Midtown, then fired the guy, told him to go home, and we rented a car. Hilarious. And then we uh, we drove out to uh, PA, whatever. But anyways, but I remember when I first met you, I asked you, I was like, how come you don't have a bunch of albums? I want to hear all your old right, stuff. Right, right. And I felt like I hit a, a, a sensitive spot, and you were like, I don't know, man, maybe because I, I made some mistakes in my career. Do you remember this? <laughs> um, Does that sound like you? Oh, Yeah. Now, do you regret not having uh, albums and CDs from the 80s and 90s? Because I feel like it's hard to find your old stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't regret it, no. Oh, that's good. I don't care. I mean, um, why would I care at this point? You know what I mean? It's like, you like you said. You have a body of work. Yeah. But I mean, you have a body of work from the last 15 years, but not. it's hard to find. No, I know. All that 20. early stuff. But, but it was, um, you know, most of that stuff would be kind of weirdly dated, I guess, in some way or... It doesn't matter. I mean, it's so much content. Like you say, everything's so saturated. Like, you know, it just doesn't matter. Well, as a comedy fan, I wish I wish it existed. But you have the memory of it, I suppose. I guess. I can't remember. But I still have notes somewhere. I could do a reading if you want. Please. I would love that. <laughs> 
But do you remember why at the time, in the late 80s and the 90s, were you working on other stuff or it just wasn't, back then comedy was just different. It just yeah, wasn't a, it was a different game. You just didn't record. I mean, I did a show, a one-man thing on Broadway and we didn't record it. Irish uh, Goodbye. Irish Wake. Irish Wake. Irish Goodbye is a Mike Cannon and uh, Mike. Uh, no. Yeah. Is that what that's called? Yeah. Is it the name of the podcast, Irish Goodbye? It's amazing that you know Young Comics Podcast. <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> Which is another thing. I mean, this isn't a question. This is another thing I learned from you. Which I've learned so much from you. But- you have your ear to the grindstone, nose to the asshole, whatever the term right, is. Right, right. You know what young comics are doing. And don't you think that is one of the keys to remaining good and relevant? Um, Sure. I mean, you can't be in a bubble. You can't be – I mean, the comedy is so big and there's so much good and bad comedy that why would you not be interested? It's our business. I'm very interested all the time, of course, because that's what we do. But I feel like you're in the minority in that way. I feel like most older veteran comics are like, who is this fucking guy? I never heard of this person. Right, right, right. So no, do you, are you watching comedy at home or you just kind of keep enough track? Yeah, to see I watch it on YouTube. Like if I'm, if I'm, a, if I hear about something, I'll just be like, or it comes on YouTube, I'll be like, let me just see what's going on here. Let me see, you know, everybody's always putting their little clips on. I watch little clips, but it's interesting. You know what I mean? I think it's interesting to watch things to, to what. What's always been interesting to me is new material, the fact that people can have new material. Because I thought there was so much comedy when I was coming up, I go, there's going to be nothing left to talk about. And sometimes I do see bits that were older bits. They weren't stolen. It's just a similar observation. Right. But in general, I'm shocked by how much new stuff. I mean, you come out with new stuff all the time. It's great. It's original. It's unique. Oh, thank you. But I mean- that's what goes on. So, of course, I, well, who wouldn't be interested in that? It's interesting. To me, it's fascinating that the world can still put out this much comedy. Right. Because I, I have this problem sometimes, too, with, uh, where I'm like, I, I don't want to watch other comics as you get influence or you get, you know, you hear something that you're like, ah, oh, shit, I had something similar to that or I should have thought of that. Right. I mean, sometimes it's frustrating. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but if you don't do it, then you end up stealing, you end up doing hack bits right. that you think – Hey, I got this original idea, and then 80 guys did it, and you're like, oh. Now, we do a lot of bouncing, but I feel like that didn't happen a lot in your generation. What didn't? Like, Norman and Sam and I will tell you, hey, is this anybody? Have you ever heard this thing? Is this funny? That, I feel like, wasn't going, a lot, going on as much back in, in your day. No, not at all. Well, you couldn't text. You never, but I mean, you've, you, <laughs> you no could communicate. Phone. I understand. Well, that. but barely. But did you call Greg Giraldo and say, have you done something like this? Is this somebody's bit? No. I would never do that. I mean, but, you know, if if you did something with similar people, would go, hey man, you know, right. somebody does that, you're like, damn it, right? There's that too, which yeah. is very frustrating as well. Very and then you kind of gonna be like, well, how similar? And then they do it, and you're right. like, God, you're Jesus. like, yeah, they got it better, or they got it the other angle on it, man. But I mean, um, but then some people will say things, and you're like, that's not my bit. Or just you do your bit anyway, right? But um, yeah. But everybody's going to be overlapping. It's it's a little bit of overlap is natural, you know. It's like when people talked about that whole uh, thing with Amy. Uh, they said, "Oh, Amy stole that Patrice bit," and it's like neither one of them wrote that bit. That right. was the bit about one eyed pirate, all that nonsense. Right. So I mean, that's the kind of thing where you're like, guys. Let us decide certain things. Well, also, the audience now is so comedy savvy, and they, they want to discover something. It's, it, it's always yeah. funny to me how quickly audience goes to theft. You right. stole this. I got it right. on my new special. I, it's a, I guess it's a joke that's similar to Kyle Kinane. Like, this is straight up stolen. I'm like, you right. think I just decided to steal from a peer, another <laughs> famous comedian? That's what you're going to? It's just, I, I feel horrible if we have the same joke, but like, I mean, they think that over me watching seven hours of Kyle Kinane material. Can we, yeah. Can we really characterize you or Kyle Kinane as famous comedians? I don't know about that. Did I say famous? Yeah. You said another famous comedian. Well, I, 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 it was a slip of the tongue here. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, but uh, by the way, some people think that we are famous. They're like, oh my God. You guys God. are mildly famous. Don't act like you're that famous. I always I'm not even that famous. Never mind you guys. I'm sorry I said famous because I always push back against this. People say, oh my God, you're famous. And I'm like, no, yeah, nobody and knows here you who are. Like, you're subconscious about you and Kyle Kinane. Well, I meant to say successful. We'll cut this whole interview. <laughs> 
But what what was it about that many, like obviously Bill Cosby was doing a new album every year. George Carlin was doing a new special sure. every year. So what was it just a thing of like, those are for those four guys? Because you could have been doing an album every year. Um, yeah, they weren't really, I wasn't really doing albums. And I, I mean, like they were getting specials. Like I wasn't getting uh, specials. Like I wasn't getting those HBO spots. I wasn't getting them. So it was like, right. my incentive was what am I going to fill in those days? In the 90s, you're like, what are you going to film it yourself? Are you crazy? Right, right. So I wasn't getting the love that would make you put out comedy. So I would just do it and then it would just disintegrate into the ether. You know? Right. It's very zen in a way. I mean, I didn't do it on purpose. I did, like I said, if they'd been filming it, I would have done it every year, but it wasn't happening. So Right, right. I was just kind of just going on and just being like, whoa. And then suddenly the bit was dated and you're like, all right, throw that out and, you know. That's how it goes. But now it's like you are, and you were prolific back then, but it wasn't recorded as much. I assume you were prolific back then. Were you as prolific then as you are now? Um, Kind of. I mean, I think so, but it was much more uh, all over the place. But yeah, probably. I mean, I wrote a lot of stuff. I wrote all the time. Right. But probably not as as crafted, as well written, you know. But you are incredible because you are like the answer, the go-to. There's so few artists that continue to get better and do a lot of their best work oh, after 50, after 25 years in the business. I mean, there's, I would struggle to name another one. I think Scorsese is still doing great, great stuff, although you might disagree. Oh, you know I disagree. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I think he's still incredible. And actors, it's a little different, but many aren't. I mean, De Niro and Pacino are shadows of what they used to be, in yeah. my opinion. Uh, bands, I mean, very few, if any, musical artists are doing stuff as well as they did. Yeah. Um, what about your girl, Meryl Streep? Uh, I love Streep. But actors, it is a little bit easier, but I think it's hard. Like De Niro and Pacino, I think those guys gave so much to get into those and roles. And the, the quality of those things, and you're right, I do feel like, but the quality of Taxi Driver, I mean, just the character Right. Those kind of characters, you know, I, they're almost accidental. The guy wrote it in three days, Paul Schrader. Right. I mean, it's almost accidental. It's almost a, a, a you know, it's so funny because I was walking over here from the train and on 7th Avenue and I was like, boy, you know, 7th Avenue, it's still sleazy, but it doesn't have the, it used to have like set right here was all these garmentos. So it was the Jewish Garmento guys, and they'd be going to these giant lunches, and they're smoking cigars in the street. Then you had this like half a mob thing. Then you know all the black guys, Puerto Rican guys, pu pushing their dress racks. All this like ethnic specificity that's gone. So I feel like Taxi Driver to make a movie like that in those days, it would be, it would be they'd be hard pressed to do a movie like that in three days today. Right. It was it was anarchy in the city, and it was all, but it was also specific now you're somebody that really romanticizes new york city in the yes. old days and you're such a, a quintessential new yorker what is the best five ten year period of new york i mean I, it's changed so much now because but i think we've had this discussion before off air but it was also a nightmare you talk about getting mugged twice oh, you saw two muggings on the same street and at the same time and all that shit i oh, mean yeah, clearly this violent. is better yeah but it's getting a little it's getting a little dicey, yeah. but yeah, then it was very bad. But but there was something about the flavor that was there. You know what I mean? Even though, and it, I'm only looking for rose colored glasses. But 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 I would say there was just something about people dressing a certain way. It was just very. It was very dramatic. Mm -hmm. You know, like people dress like crazy, like platform shit. It was crazy. You know what I mean? Like even Taxi Driver was a little bit stilted compared to the way people used to look right and but it was dangerous and people were leaving like crazy but there was something in the air or uh, like i said just the fact that you'd go to the i forget the name of the they're these delis these big delis that all the garmento guys would go to and i went to a couple of them and they'd be like yelling and smoking and <laughs> eating and just like scream and there was a life to people people were like Screaming to stay alive in some funny way at the time that that was a little more you know it just felt more at least impulsive and you know less guarded obviously than today but like now I feel like nobody smiles now I feel like 
Sometimes you're doing stand up and it takes a minute before the crowd goes, Oh yeah, this is funny. Like we're allowed to laugh. It's not so right. you know what I mean? There's something strange in the air, I think, you know. Yeah. Ari Shafir's sister, I think, is like a um professor at a college and she said the thing that's so striking about it now is nobody's having fun. Right. It's all uh, activism, which is great, but it's like there's no like toga parties and a fucking sure. Halloween drunk party. Everyone's like, we got to get together and stop Bill number 17 or whatever. Right. Fuck. Yeah. Um, which is also positive, but th- there's less fun. But it's positive if they know what they're talking about. You know what I mean? Right. right. That's, That's a whole the other, other problem, you know? But I mean, uh, yeah, no, it's a very severe uh, Puritan uh, type of society. Now, do you get depressed about the city? Do you get depressed about. Things we like to talk about depression. No, on I here. used to get depressed. I used to get depressed about the city like fifteen years ago. Right. But now I'm just used to it. But I mean, I know it's shot. I know it's it's never going to be what it was, and that's the way it is. You know what I mean? But but it really ended. And my, you know, my thing is like you know it end. The thing that I look back longingly, which was also a nightmare. Was the seventies, which has gone for a hundred years already? It's fifty years, forty years, whatever. So I mean, so it's not that, you know, it's not it's not just hitting me now. Right, right. Now I want to go back to what made you have such a burst of creative energy in the last fifteen years and and be so prolific and so successful. Well, I just, I mean, because I just started to um, try to organize under a, a, the principle of one theme. Right. Because I was like, I'm sick and tired of working randomly. And it's not like it ever was that successful with the audience. You know what I mean? I was always a comedian's comedian's comedian. You know what I mean? Like, yes. always. From the day I started, even when I didn't even, not only did I know, know what it was, I didn't even want to be that. And it still was the way it was. It was just, it was my uh, destiny. You know what I mean? Right. From the beginning. It was crazy. <laughs> and all my other young open mic friends would be jealous because all the comedians would come up and talk to me that was established. Right, right. Because <laughs> I was just, and the audience didn't like me. I wasn't doing better than anybody else. Right. I was doing worse. So, but I mean, um, so it's just, I wanted to organize it and put it into order, you know? But it must, uh, this is a side question. I just go uh, randomly because you keep making me think of something else. How long did it take for you to accept? Because there must have been times where you're like, I want a massive audience. Oh, yeah. But you have the comics. Because I feel similarly, not to compare myself to you. No, yeah. But I feel similarly in that every, Ari Shafir said it years ago when we first met. He goes, you're an interesting case because every comedian thinks you're great, but you have no career whatsoever. Right. Uh, I have some career now. But I feel similarly where I feel like all these great comics and i'm not trying to toot my own right. asshole here but like you know you and burr and yeah. louie and 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 uh and norm and all these guys right. say great things about me and i'm very grateful but i still haven't found this mass audience because there is no mass f- audience for that well there's a mass ma- more mass than i have certainly i can name a few no people. i'm saying there's no mass audience if that's you take it from me i'm telling you if your thing in life is that there's no mass audience. There was no mass audience for Norm. Right. Norm did clubs. I did casinos with Norm, and we did well, but not blowing out some theaters. Right, right. And maybe we could have gone to that by now, I guess, but at the t- this is only five, six years ago. Right. And so that's just, that's not the way it works. Right. You know? So, but it, I, I imagine it took you some time to accept that. You said, I have, yeah, the, I have the respect of, you know, yeah. Jerry Seinfeld and, and sure. whoever, yeah. but not selling the tickets. No, I was that, always like, wait a minute, I want to be able to sell. But, but yeah, it just became, it just became like, no, you got to, the you got to live with, in reality. You know, I'm not saying it couldn't blow up that way. If you, I'm just saying that it tends to be a, a different, uh, I guess a different energy or whatever, and it's like maybe you know what I mean. I I I have no idea. I just, I know what I know what my thing was now when I look back, right? Which was you know mumbling and rant and self referencing and just you know not not trying to uh, uh, not placate, but not trying to. Uh, charm them right right you know in a certain way that you have to yeah you kind of invented that that should have done better that deserved more right isn't that your yeah (laughs) 
I always used to say that. <laughs> um, I remember um, I was doing that one time. We worked together. You saw me, and you're like, you shouldn't do that so much because it's uh, isolating, and uh, also that's my thing. It was something to, that, something to that degree. We were like, it's not, the audience is the best they can be, and it doesn't make sense, and also, uh, that's mine. Yeah, well, it was funny. It was something very similar to that. It was very funny. That's funny. But I, I've brought this up with you before, and maybe this is me doing more looking into your career than, than you are, or maybe it's me trying to make something. And I, I called you about it. This is years ago. You were on Stern. Yeah. I don't know how long ago it was. Maybe 20 years ago or 15 years ago. And Stern, you looked overweight, and Stern was kind of busting your balls about yeah, your career. Right. And you were like, eh, I don't know, you know, whatever. And I was watching it years later. It was like, it had been out five or six years later, and all I could think is like, man, like, you really turned this around. You were in great shape, and at that time, you were on Girls and Amy's movie, and you released a book, or maybe two books, and done two one-man shows that were big and on Broadway and all this stuff. And in my mind, I was like, was that like a, a career bot or a creative bottom with Stern shitting on you? Or was that just, you don't no, even remember I that? No, I was think very, I was very fat. Right. And very um, depressed. Yeah. I mean, if you want to talk about depression, I was I in a real depression. As you can see, I was two, I was almost, I was 248 at some at one point. Oh, wow. So I was really fat. And um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, um. Yeah, I was in a very depressed place in the, in the 2000s, you know. Yeah, because in my mind, I drew a line from, because I watched it after it had come out, I didn't see it when it came yeah. out. And I was like, this is crazy, because yeah. it was just, you were in so hot in the, whatever years those were. I right. mean, mid-2015. Yeah, it was right after that. It was, it was right after, it was after Tough Crowd and a lot of things in my life. And I just, I just, you know, I was depressed. I was really depressed for about five years. Oh, Jesus. That's you a know. long depression. Yeah. I'm very depressed. Right. And, um, but, you know, a lot of it was uh, self-inflicted. Right. I don't feel like I'm, uh, I don't feel like I'm naturally that depressed of a person. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like a lot of it was self-inflicted behavior, you know, just not, not really looking at where I, what, what I was or what I was doing. And it was just a strange, strange thing. Well, that's what I mean, I guess, about private, because I don't think people know you or think of you as like, oh, that's a guy that struggles with mental health, because you're such a, I don't know the word, jovial, out, out, outgoing. It yeah. seems like you're you're a very social person. Yeah, you I, don't seem very happy. I don't struggle with it. But at that time, I didn't even know I was depressed. Right. You would think, I'd look at myself and see I was 248 pounds and go, wow. Right. But I didn't even register, like, that's how removed I was from it. It didn't even register, like... You're 248 pounds. What are you? Right. You're not depressed? Right. And I'm, so it was really a strange a strange thing in that way, you know? Like not looking at that as being a sign of depression. Right. And now was there a moment in those years that you were like, all right, I'm going to fucking start really... I always picture... I have like an athletic approach. But I, I right. picture people in like a... Um, like a musical montage of like doing push-ups right. and fucking really writing and listening to sets. I think if your friend Chris Rock talked about after SNL, he's right. like, I'm just going to put my head down and go on the road. And he came back with Bring the Pain. Right. Did you have a moment like that of like, I'm going to go make these fucking shows? Or is it just sort of a day at a time working on something? All of a sudden you're like, oh shit, I got a great show here. Yeah. No, I mean, I had done one man shows before in right. the 90s. And then I just did, a, I did one one man show. That never called, about, uh, but anyway, and I lost all the weight. I said, I'm just going to stop eating like this. This is crazy. I can't lose the weight. This is nuts. Mm -hmm. And so I lost 60 pounds in about three months, maybe. Wow. I mean, I just really, I was dieting like crazy. And I was doing this other one-man show that I did, but I didn't really go. I didn't do anything with it. But then Sandler just called me coincidentally to do grown-ups. And he goes, this is how well he knows me. He goes, Come on, man. Just say yes. Don't say no. Just do it. <laughs> and so I go, all right. <laughs> and then, so I already lost the weight. And then I was like, all right. And then next year I started doing a show, you know. Wow. And then how did um, Girls come about? Did you audition for that? No, Judd called me up and said, hey, do you want to do Girls? And and I was like, yeah, all right, you know. Wow. Well, and, you're uh, great on that. I thought, oh, thanks. And did you come from an acting back? Did you take acting classes and stuff like I that? I took a lot of acting classes and I never understood it. Until one day, this lady, I went to really good acting teachers sometimes, and I never got it. 
I would accidentally be good. And then this lady, Sandra Lee, I was doing this thing in her class in the 90s. And I always give her credit because I was doing a scene and she critiqued in front of the class after she goes to the girl, gives her notes, and she goes, and you, ooh, ooh, and starts mocking me <laughs> that I was mugging and overacting. And for some reason, it made me laugh. And I go, and that that was the light went on. And I go, oh, yeah, I'm trying. And the whole thing about acting is the minute you're trying, you're going to fail. Right. You know? It's, it's such a weird thing. But if you're trying, pushing, or just trying at all, you're screwed. It's a funny thing with acting with comedians because it feels like we all want to be actors and we like acting, but we also just look at it as stupid. And I always think this, I just did an audition the other day, like an, uh, what do you call it, self-tape. Yeah. And I want to be in movies, but I just want, you know, people to just give me the movie. Because I've always felt that about auditions with stand-up or acting. Yeah. I'm like, just give it to me and I'll do fine. Right. I'll, I won't make, right. I won't embarrass you. I swear right. to God. But to do like a self tape, an audition, which means you know you record your own yeah. audition at home and then mail it, either mail it to them. It's the antithesis of stand up, or the kind of stand up I try to do, which is very genuine and like these are real stories. This is me telling a real story. Right. To sit there and have you know a guy with a camera, and I'm going, well, I don't know about that. It just feels ridiculous to pretend act by yourself in a room, but but that's what acting is. That's. What it's imaginary, being real in imaginary circumstances. Right. And the other part of it is that I feel like, and I've said this to other comedians when they're doing something that I go, hey, you don't have to try to be funny. You're funny. Right. We're funny people. The minute we try, it's like, it's almost like you're going on stage like, hey, guy, it's just, it's sweaty, it's needy, it's fake, and that's, so you, you have to be real in imaginary circumstances. But you can't be fake in imaginary circumstances. Right. And a lot of times, so that's acting, you know. But yeah, a lot of times the script sucks and you just, what am I doing? But you can't think about it. If you think, if the minute you go, this is this script sucks or this script is stupid, you're fucked. It's got to be like, no, I believe what I'm saying. I believe I'm this person. It's almost like insanity. Right. I believe it and then you deliver it. Don't, James Cagney used to say, look him in the eye and tell the truth. Mm. And that's like, you know. And I'll give you the advice that I read in a Michael Caine book years ago, and it was such great advice. He goes, because he wrote this book on, and he's a great actor. Every, every, he's never bad. And he goes, if you all else fails, he goes, when you're desperate, just think that emotion. So if you're in a scene and you can't get anything else, just think, if we're doing a scene right now, I'm angry. Just think that in my head. I'm angry. Or I'm happy. I'm thinking I'm happy. So I'm not doing anything. The good thing about that, in my opinion, then it takes the focus off, I'm on camera. Right, I have to right. act angry. Right. That's smart. Yeah. Now, do you still pursue acting at all? No, I, I don't like acting at all. Oh, really? I, I'm not a fan. I mean, it's not my game. I don't like it. Oh, don't, just... Every time I'm sitting in a trail, I get depressed. Oh, no. Well, you're great at it. I hate it. Well, even if you hate it, you're great at it. I like uh, cop show. I like fake, fake bad acting. Oh, right. Well, that's like... That's... Act, different acting. I know, but it's still acting and you're still great. And that was another thing I left off when I was naming all these creative endeavors you've had in the last 15 years. That was years. a fun one. That was making fun of acting. Yeah, but it was, it was fantastic. Which, script writing. which, by the way, you've created this persona on Twitter and in the show that yeah. is just really fun, which is a level of success. Your boy, Jerry, said there's four levels of success in comedy. Making friends laugh, making strangers laugh, getting paid to make strangers laugh, and having people talk like you because it's fun. Have you ever heard that? No. That's pretty good. It's good. But I do, I, I'm do. i doing you all the time. And I go, uh, not true. Oh. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do your thing. Mm. Um, but that like that kind of, um, like what you do on Twitter is very fun to do. It's fun. Yeah. But you don't want to get too into it either. You know, like that's the fun thing about stand-up. Here's the thing why I love stand-up to this day. I love it, even though I don't want to do it most of the time. I'm doing it for 100 years. But- it's so honest in that all the talk and all the speculation, you have a backstage, you talk to a couple of comedians, they philosophize about stand up. You still got to go out there and it's like jumping in an ocean with waves. So suddenly all the bullshit or all the theory or all the ideas you have, they mean nothing because now you're here in front of a crowd. Now what? And how many people, you know, 
that don't do stand up go, I can do stand up, and then they try it. Even they try to do a joke in a speech. Right. They're actors. They're whatever, and they're bombing. Right. Because this is no. This is real. Yes. This crowd is not laugh. It's the only thing. It, it's involuntary. Laughter is involuntary. Music. Somebody gets up and plays. I always say this. Somebody gets up and plays music, and even if they suck or you think they suck, you can't play that instrument, right? right? Somebody gets up and bombs, you could get up there and not get laughs too. So they really are no better than you at that moment. Right, <laughs> right, right. So that's what's so amazing about stand-up. That's another great Jerry line where he says, stand-up comedy is the only art form where it's not done well. People deny that it is the art form. That's funny. Well, like a bad were... painting, no one's like, that's not a painting. Right. It's still a painting. That's but funny. if you do stand up unsuccessfully, you're not even doing comedy. Right. You're just a guy you're, you're saying You're just a guy things. talking, yeah. Yeah, music, so, if it's out of tune, it's still music. Yes. It's just bad music. That's so funny. Um, but sp speaking of Jerry, yes. I want to talk about comedian, which uh, is interesting because I asked you this recently also off camera. Well, this is the only conversation we've ever had on camera. So everything Whoa. I'm referencing has been off camera. But you were in comedian, obviously, you're like a main character right. in the film. But you're in it, so you didn't watch it more than a couple times, I right. assume, maybe the premiere. Yeah. But to me, I've seen that movie 50 times. I reference it constantly. Yeah. So it's like a huge part of my life. And I had just started doing comedy. When I came, I've been doing comedy for two years when that came out. Right. So it was a big deal to me. But it's nothing to you. Right. Which is fascinating. But the reason I was bringing it up is you do the thing, you're talking about Jack Nicholson. I don't even know if you remember this. About I remember, yeah. How comedy is so just, because even if they love you, you know, Jack, and you, and you do an act that where you go, Jack... <laughs> the idea of them kicking Nicholson off stage because he's not getting laughs. Yeah. Is so funny. And that it's exactly what you're speaking to is like they can love you, know you, excited. And I've watched a million big celebrities come and do guest spots and they go, This sucks. We want Greg Rogel back. That's right. We want somebody we want somebody who comes prepared and is gonna bring us their thing and try to make us laugh. Right. Now, when you did comedian, was that like a big deal at the time? Or you just thought, okay, this is no. something? Did you think this is gonna be no. No, it was just, this will be fun. Yeah. No, it meant, I mean, it was, you know how it is. It's just one of the, I mean, it's like, people just run around. At that time, a lot of people were making little documentaries and comedy. And, right. I mean, Comedy Cell has been like documentary to death, really. Yeah, of course. And that was like a big, that gave it a big spike, right? After that, or, or not I so much. Know. Maybe that movie wasn't that big, because I just was obsessed with it, Yeah, obviously. no, I think it was a comedian's movie. But it did okay. It was popular, but I think it was a comedian. Thing. Right. Well, that was mind blowing to hear Jerry swear, which was right, very exciting. Right. He says "fuck" in like the first couple of minutes. Well, was it was like, so Whoa. funny because uh, you know the owner of uh, Governors at the time was this other guy, not the owner now. Yeah. And he goes to Jerry. Jerry didn't understand. It was like a big deal. He's back doing stand up. The show just ended, and the guy goes, "Um, I need you to do." Uh, 45 first show tonight. It's in this, it's in this show. Come here. <laughs> Jerry goes, I'm doing an hour, you know, I'm trying. And he goes, yeah, I need you to do 45 the first show. That's great. And Jerry looked at him like, what? He goes, you see this? This is what still goes on. Like, this guy thinks, he's got Jerry doing him a huge favor at the time, right. going back to clubs. Right. And he's still trying to say, hey, this is the way it's going to work. It's like, stop, you know. I love that. There's another great moment at Governors with George Shapiro, which, you know, no disrespect, but it always seems like it, it, it sums up the industry is, and maybe it's just edited this way, but he goes, yeah, they're great. It's a nice, lively audience. And it cuts to Jerry on stage and everyone's just talking and right, it's just loud right. and disruptive. But the, the manager's going, it's great. They're lively. It's like, no, they're drunk and, and yelling and talking. I know. But so go back to that. I mean, I'm sure you've talked about the Comedy Cellar. We've done documentaries about the Cellar. But when I first started coming as a patron in 2003, yeah. I went to New York Film Academy here in New York and was a young comic. And I would go there every night. And back then, it was still just one show that would go all night. It would start at wow. 7 and go to 1 o'clock in the morning. Wow. I didn't know it was back then even. Yeah, that was like, oh, three, which wow. feels not that long ago. But no. on a weekday, I would, because I would be the only one that would stay yeah. all night. And Artie Fuqua would close every show, wow. and I would see you a bunch. Wow. And um, I th at that time, Chappelle was doing like season two, I think. of Ch So he popped in a bit. Wow. And it was DePaulo and Norton and um, yeah. maybe Geraldo I would see. And sure. a few other guys. And, um, but... 
Is that like a? Do you look at that as like a, the glory days of the cellar, or what's what's the? Um, best part no, of the I mean that was good times at the cellar. I don't look at glory days for the cellar. Cellar has a lot of glory days, in my opinion. Right. I'm. I went there in 1985, and I was like, this place is amazing on right. the weekends. So the cellar I've always just loved. So it's it's the glory. The late 90s was glory days too. That pop started popping again. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's had a bunch of. Different things, you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. in the late 90s, all these other clubs went out. All the other clubs that were famous died out in the mid-90s That they because it was comedy bust after right. comedy boom. And the cellar was the only one. And suddenly it started popping a little bit. Suddenly it was getting crap. And then during the week, and everybody's coming in, and Jerry's there, and Chris is coming in, and all these other people coming in. So it was really, that was a glory time too, the late 90s. Right. Do you think, is there anybody that loves comedy and and comics more than you it feels like you're so um you know at home with comedians you just truly love comedians i can i can feel it yeah yeah well you do yeah sure. i feel like all comedians do i feel like comedians some comedians don't but i'm saying as a general rule when comedians see each other like any bit it's like any business you get excited and yeah. you just speak a language and we just speak a certain type of humor that's sort of like like even the biggest hacks in the world kind of know they're not as hacky on off stage right, right you know right, what i mean right and it's just like there's a there's a whatever our thing is you just feel it but every job has that i'm sure you know well chris had the great thing he said somewhere um, obviously i consume a lot of comedy interviews but i think it was great maybe it was jerry maybe they're on i think it was on comedians and cars maybe where he says when you're at a party some kind of showbiz party or a family party, whatever kind of party right. and you see a comedian you go over and you go Comedian, like it's like a it's like a float in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Like, oh my god. Thank yeah. God. Yeah. But which again, and I try, I get very frustrated. And I think we've talked about this too. Like when comedians conflate our career and job. I think yes. most jobs are probably like that to some of degree. Of course they are. Yeah. I mean, certainly. Absolutely. But I mean, maybe two plumbers seeing each other are not as relieved to see each I other. I bet they are. Maybe. I said, I bet if they're involved, because we're dealing with people's personalities. So if they're dealing with something job related, I guarantee they're related. Because we're dealing at a party with conversation, which is what we do for a living. Right. So if you see two plumbers and something's going on where everybody's saying stupid shit about the plumbing problem, they must be like, oh, thank God. Right. Somebody right. Gets <laughs> right, it. right. You know? Yeah. Um, oh, fuck. There was something I was going to say about this. Oh, that's a. And not a question necessarily, but the comedian, the movie, also the commentary is something I've watched a million times, which is you and yeah. Jerry. And it's like its own movie, and it's so great. But there's a great moment where Jerry says, what's better than hanging out with comedians? And you go, nothing. And yeah. it really, uh, it touches me. It moves me. Yeah. And uh, you also have one of the funniest lines ever. Um, two, actually, with Jerry. He brings out something in you that's, uh, maybe it's his snarkiness and your uh, wit, but he says... In the end of the movie, the climax, which has been ruined now because Bill Cosby has been revealed to be a serial rapist, yeah. which really fucked up the climax of the film. Oh. The end of the film is just Jerry meeting Bill and Bill giving him this really sage wisdom advice. <laughs> and Jerry's literally like, I want to go where he's gone. <laughs> and it's really makes the end of the movie kind of oh my god, a little weird. But anyways, Jerry, Bill is saying to Jerry, you know, you can look back on your career and you can compare yourself to Joe Lewis. Bill, do you remember this? No. Bill Russell, Joe Lewis, Muhammad Ali, Willie Mays, and then you go, name a white guy, Bill. You're making us uncomfortable. <laughs> it gets a huge, <laughs> it gets a huge. I mean, Jerry feels like he gets mad. He's like, come on, don't ruin this moment for me. But it's very funny. <laughs> it's a very funny moment. And the other one is in Comedians in Cars when uh, Jerry says quite rudely, I think. He says, if you don't have kids, there's nothing really to live for. Right. And you say, uh, everybody says Downton Abbey's pretty good. Oh. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> no. These are two of your great lines that I quote all the time. Well, Co- by the way, Cosby never, I was never a big Cosby comedy wise. I always thought he had that attitude of like, I'm the mature one. My kids are fucked up. My wife is fucked up. I'm the only guy that gets it. And I was always like, eh, I hate that personality. There's nothing to do with the molestation. It's just I don't like that angle of comedy. Well, I'd like to, you are the cool guy, and everybody else is an asshole. I suppose so, but I think I think I, I'm going to push back on this, and I say he's pretty great. Well, you also the hate the Sopranos. 
That's true, but don't you see my point at least about The Sopranos? Nope. I no, I made a point, and you said don't say that on camera. You said you do see it once. What was it? My point is that fucking Polly Walnuts and uh, Stevie Van Zant right. are cartoony. They're like Stevie Van Zant, who is my guitarist in my favorite band ever, which also right. takes me out of me. Is wearing like a rubber wig and he's like, hey, <laughs> he's he's like a yes, cartoon, and it's so it takes me out of it. Yes. But as I told you, I guarantee Paulie Walnuts gave them half the stories. Right. Well, he was a real was guy. A real guy. And I guarantee, and he was around in the 60s, and I guarantee a lot of those stories came out of him. Or at least a lot of like, hey, what about this? And then he adds something, and you're like, oh my God. That's the next episode. You know what I mean? But I've I've si I've since switched my take because I've gotten so much pushback on this. Is I don't care <laughs> for the art form. I'm not a TV drama guy. I don't like any TV shows. TV drama. You like The Wire? I don't like The Wire. I tried. I mean, I, wow, you don't I, like anything? Well, I don't because I don't like that medium. I like a film. Give me a two hour film. I don't like a show, an episodic thing. And I well, think there's a um, an amount of and I'll get all this shit for set, like an amount of cheese. Maybe not cheese isn't the right word, or unauthenticity in a TV because show. They you have don't to get keep in a film. it going. For yes, you, yeah, yeah. You don't get in a film. And I think you know Edie Falco is amazing. I think Gandolfini is great. And I also was surprised when I started watching The Sopranos how like sitcomy it is. I feel like I can see the they punch did up. that it's deliberately. Jokey. I understand that, but so that's why it's funny. But Goodfellas but, is hilarious, and it's not that. But, but. Don't you, by the way, Goodfellas, I told you, it keeps dropping now. Uh, I put Goodfellas, I put Mean Streets ahead of Goodfellas. I love that's Mean right. Streets, but I just think that's crazy. Well, that's what I'm saying right here, right now. I mean, that's Mean crazy. Streets ahead of Goodfellas. Now, one thing that I, I love, and I always want to give your number to people when I hear them say Casino is better than Goodfellas. There are a few people that think this. Casino stinks. The only good part about Casino is Sharon Stone. Every bit of I it. I think that's the only bad part of it. What? Yeah, that's right. Casino stinks. De Niro's phony in it. He's not even doing a Chicago accent. That's true. But I think it's a fun film. It's very funny. It's one of the funniest Scorsese films, I think. Casino is, I mean, De Niro was miscast. I like that theory. of. Uh, believe me, I've, I've said all your theories. That's, John Turturro, you said. Oh, he'd be great. He would have been great. Uh, well, we've devolved into movie talk here. I mean. I know. I'm Back sorry. to stand up. <laughs> so and, and 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 life. Yeah. Talk. Now, do you have? You must sense. Do you think about it? Do you feel it? The reverence that every single comedian has for you, because you are a guy that no comedian thinks ill of. Well, that's not true. There's a few that do that don't like me. Well, I like everything else, they're fucking idiots. Whoever they are. Well, thank you. But I mean, uh, no, I love. I like you said. I love comedians. I love the comedians. Love me. So I do love it. I do. I love it. And I love, I was so, I mean, I, I was so grateful to be in this business, except during my depressed fat years when I was sort of just like, I mean, you know, I go on the road. I had to, I had to wear, I could only wear sweatshirts. I was so fat. Another great line in the comedian commentary. The more out of shape you are, the more workout clothes you wear. <laughs> that was your other gym. You're very funny. <laughs> Thanks. But, uh, but so, yeah. So I love, I love, that I've been able to be in this bit. It's, you know, to, it takes years. Like at first, people would come up to me, oh, you're so lucky you make people laugh. Like, oh, give me a break. Fucking, what does that mean? And now I'm like, wow, wow, I am lucky to make people laugh. Right. You know? And you make your crowd laugh. Like I said, you talk about big name. We all want to sell out stadiums, of course. I mean, big things. But- to make your crowd laugh is also really important. Right. So even if it's a couple hundred people, which is something. Sure. It's like, oh, no, these people want to see me because we're on the same wavelength. Right. No, that's a special feeling. And that's for me. And I, this is something else I want to ask you about. I know we got to wrap up soon. But this is something else I'd like to ask you about is did you something that has held me back throughout my career yeah is that i never had proper ambition or goals my goal starting out was also a big part of this is just hating myself and not getting any confidence and yeah, being completely of insecure and then obviously i fucked up a lot with sure. substance abuse and all that shit but 
a big thing for me was my goal starting was I want to be a comedian. Yes. I want to be yes. a comedian. Yes. I didn't think I want to get on this or I want to get on that. I no. thought I want to be a comedian in Boston and then I'll move to New York. Yeah. And those are my only goals yeah. or ambitions, which didn't have a great effect on me because I thought, all right, well, I'm in Boston, I'm doing comedy. Yeah. And then I moved to New York and I thought, well, I'm in New York, I'm doing comedy. Yeah. And, it, and, and when I started setting some goal, I want to do Letterman, it worked out. And I still find myself rudderless and going, I don't know what to do next yeah. or how to succeed even right. other than just do comedy. So I think that was a big uh, part of it. So did you have that similarly? Were you just kind of yes. like, I'll just be a comic? Yes. I don't know. Comic, I keep... I to this day I'm like I want to work on something else, but then I'm like oh I got to work on this bit. I want to make this bit really funny, even though nobody but me really cares about that bit. Maybe a few people appreciate it, but it's still like I want to get that bit, right? Whatever it is, and then the next like what does this mean in the grand scheme of life? But to make it in a comedy form, you know what I mean? Right. So that's just my little goal, and I can't get away from that. And that's that's not the way. It, you have to be more presentational and. You know what I mean? There's a certain style that either you do it that way or you don't. And some people don't look. Some people just naturally. You look at a guy like Nate Bogatze. Mm -hmm. Nate Bogatze naturally speaks a certain way. Right. And not to mention he's got the whole, he's got the entire South to himself. But, <laughs> um, but you know, you've got to go with what who you are. Like I used to be like, oh, I probably could have changed a few things and I could have. But ultimately, you like you said, what are we doing here? We're trying to be funny comedians. Right. And, you know, you're putting out great specials all the time because you care about the quality of your work. Right. So that's not going to be necessarily, I don't know how big it can get, but I'm just saying it's quality. And that's the way it has to be for you, you know? Thank you. Well, that's another great Jerry line, by the way. He said, every comedian is doing what he's able to do. There's yeah. no comedian. Like sometimes people are like, well, you should do more one liners. Or why don't you try telling stories? Right. Like whatever a comedian is doing, that's what he's capable of yeah. doing, which I yeah. always thought was an interesting thought, too. It's like Brian Regan is not going to start doing like absurdist one liners. Right. And Steve Martin's not going to start doing, you know, uh, strange, serious strange, stories. Strange example. Uh, what, whatever. What the like, hell? Why I don't know. He isn't a comedy in 58 years, but yeah, you know what God, I mean. God, I know. It was bizarre. Now, last question. I know we got to wrap up. I, I appreciate you coming and, and, and volunteering your time. It's a, it's very exciting for me to have you. What <laughs> I that came off uh, insincere, mm -hmm. but it is. Who, when, when, when did your like love of stand-up start, and was it a big relief from your, for your childhood? Did you have a... Were you I, stressed and anxious and depressed and you no, saw comics? And you not went, oh, at all. I was, a, I was a funny, big mouth extrovert but i watched stand-up when i was a little kid every t every stand-up i watched i was like what a life i used to see them smoking it was like a nightclub wearing a tuxedo but the tuxedo tie was off and i was like these guys are having a life like they were drinking and i was like this looks like fun i mean i was watching the old time comics and just something about that humor and then i remember focusing on don rickles when i was like 13 oh and this guy's just mean and funny and then we were prior and carlin came along and just blew it and then and everybody was i was i anybody that grew up with me would tell you i peaked at 13 athletically and comedically <laughs> and it's not it's not an exaggeration maybe 15 that was it so the, i stopped it for years because of my substance abuse i stopped doing it and I, when i when i finally got clean i started trying to do can't stand up again right because so for many years i didn't do anything related to that but i was supposed to be doing i mean i i was focused on stand up when i was 14 wow. 13 and 14 i go this is looks like so much fun nightclubs i just love the idea of smoking and drinking and being out at these nightclubs and being funny and throwing quick one liners at people you know yeah 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 but um, yeah, it is the thing, and I, I, I'm just quoting Jerry over and over again. But I think he said this somewhere too, or maybe it was my own. Maybe this is my own thought, and I'm crediting it to Jerry. Well, maybe he did say it, and I just felt the, the same. But the idea when you're young and you find out that that is a job, it's mind blowing. Yeah, that that's an option. Yeah, you can go into. And I was a young kid during the comedy boom. It was on an A and E yeah. evening of the Improv and VH1 and MTV and and, and of course HBO. It was just everywhere. I remember seeing you as a young kid and just being like, 
this is crazy. That, that's got to be me. I need that. I need to do that. Well, when I was doing it, that wasn't really the thing. But like Freddie Prinze was famous. David Brenner, Robert Klein, George Collin, Richard Pryor. And it was a couple of others, but it was basically those people. Right. And we were all like, I guess everybody got into comedy. It's like, I'm going to be like, but there weren't well, clubs or anything like that. They were, by the time I got into it, they started clubs. Right. But before that, there were no clubs. But still, it was like, it just, I feel like people are just born to do stand up. You know, you can tell some people, they're just, so like I said, even the hacks, some of them are just stand ups. They're lazy stand ups, but they just have that stand up take like their angle is always something where you're like that's kind of funny now what about the people you must know a lot of these people that are the funniest people you've ever met that never got into stand up yes I oh yeah I mean because being from my best friend Derek and my uncle Brian are like yeah. two of truly the funniest people they're, they're funnier than every comedian I've ever met yes do you, do you think in another time and place or world they could have done stand up or is just some people that are just that funny they can't well, they they, don't have it's it. just because it, you, you have to kill a little part of yourself to be a stand-up, too, I feel like. So they would have to kill a little bit of that organic self to be a fucking stand-up. Right. You know? If they're willing to do that, you, but but you have to. You right. know? And that's, you know what I mean? You can't, you can't go in there with any... I would say the one thing in comedian, they can never feel sorry for you. They can hate you. But you can never, they should never feel sorry for you. Right, right. They can hate my guts, but I don't want them to ever fucking feel sorry. That's not stand-up. Right. Boy, well, I could talk stand-up all day. I know. It's I, really I, it's uh, really interesting. I appreciate it is uh, interesting. you doing it. Talk about how funny Nick DiPaolo is on stage and off stage. I mean, Nick DiPaolo... <laughs> I always want to talk about Nick. ...speaks in punchline. Norm McDonald would stay at his house where he goes, that guy Nick is so funny. I go, yeah, he goes... He speaks in punchlines. And I go, you're right. He, he speaks does. in punchlines. And um, yeah, he's the only guy. <laughs> we did this thing. Uh, I always tell that story, but after 9 uh, 11, we were in Guantanamo Bay, like 12 people in Patrice is there, all these other comedians. And even the ones that didn't like Nick, which plenty of people didn't, he had a busload full of people convulsed in <laughs> laughter just for his commentary as we passed. Things in this bus, right? Driving around Guantanamo Bay Island, he, I mean, Patrice, I mean, he didn't give it up that he's people were doubled over. There's just he's spontaneously just fuck. I mean, that's why he even hates to write, not because he doesn't want to write. Of course, Benny has to write, but because he says shit sometimes on stage where you're like, God damn it, that's the pure. That's like that. Um, I don't know, you would call it Ted Williams or Sugar Ray Robinson, just somebody where you're like, oh, this goddamn guy's doing something yeah. from a natural place. Yeah, no, it's special. And it's like, that is like, you talk about like, uh, you know, gratitude. I, I mean, I, I make gratitude lists. That guy, yeah. that I have had access to him on a personal level and spent this much time, I was like, what a what a gift. Cause yes. I, I mean, we, we made that movie and every night, just on the fucking floor yes. laughing. Yes. Yes. And uh, it's hard to describe to somebody uh, special talent. No, it's like being, it's like you're, if you, if somebody wrote a really witty movie and every time that character came in, they threw witty lines, only he's saying them extemporaneously, like off the top of his head. Right, right. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he's amazing. Well, you're amazing, and uh, you're my my idol and my hero, and I appreciate you coming and doing this. And uh, I'm glad, I'm glad, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm glad we did it. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, well, give some plugs. Where uh, what are well, they? Well, the only plug I'd like to know is what's the name of this goddamn show? Mindful Metal Jacket. It's a pun. Everybody hates. Oh, the title. Mindful Metal Jacket. Yeah, we didn't really get into mindfulness, but we talked a little depression and growing up and all that stuff. We talked about my horrible depression. Yeah, there we go. That so. was a real depression, but I really didn't understand at the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. I didn't understand what it was. I like that you're putting the coat on as you're leaving. Well, that's how it's done. <laughs> um, but you got through it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Well, that, well, we're grateful that you did. You're an American treasure. Where do they find you? What's that? I'd um, say you're an American I'll be treasure. At, uh, <laughs> well, when's this coming out? I can put it out as soon as you're, you're, uh, you're aces. You're, I put you to the top. Are you kidding? I'm I might release Austin. it tomorrow. I'm in Austin this weekend. What? At Rogan's Club. Then I'm at uh, Toronto next weekend. And then... Uh, How long are you in Austin till? Just Collingwind.com. Um, till Sunday. Ah, I go Monday. Oh, wow. We're just like with ships in the night. You're going for the whole week? I'm going Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm See, that's your problem is your timing. Right now, as you're here in the city doing this podcast, 
Rich Voss is in Astoria. What? That's right. He's doing Shane Gillis. You missed two ships that passed in the night. You oh, could, my. You could have had Rich Voss. My God. Well, I'll be in uh, I'll be in Austin right after you. I'm doing uh, a little podcast you might have heard of, the Joe Rogan Experience. Whoa! Fourth time. This is the one. This Whoa, is the one I blow I love up. It. This is the time I'm going to blow up. Good. I'm going to really take a different approach yeah. and really attack Joe. Yeah. I'm gonna, <laughs> so, Joe, you don't look that tough to me. I'm going to say some controversial stuff this yeah. time. And uh, but anyway, so we're just missing each other. But thank you for doing it. Colin. That's great. I'm sorry, I'm going to miss you. All right, my pleasure. Yeah, you're the best. Thank you. See you, Joe.